Um, so before we start with this new uh, section about PCA, um, I want again to go back for a minute to the uh, central limit theorem. Um, I hope you still remember what happens when you take, I mean, you have some uh, random variable x and an arbitrary distribution like, let's take for a moment, a uniform distribution. Huh? Um, and then you would expect the mean to be right in the middle. Huh? So when you make a measurement for the mean of this variable, I mean, what is a measurement for the mean? You measure this random variable independently like 100 times and then you average over it. And then you would expect some value around the middle. And then if you look at this new variable defined as the mean, then this new variable again would have a distribution, a density function, and the density function of the mean asymptotically for n towards infinity becomes a normal distribution. Yeah? And the more experiments you make, the more narrow this distribution becomes. Um, and now I prepared an exercise for you, which is at the end of this new uh, uh, handout. And this is the result of the exercise. So you should get this. Yeah? Um, now look, if you take one measurement, that's the red line here, then you of course get a uniform distribution because uh, this is your random variable. If you take two measurements, then you get this. Um, okay, okay, and I have to uh, mention that the distribution only is a discrete distribution. You only have these five parts. These five values, zero through four, each one with a probability of uh, one over five. And now if you take two measurements, then you get these green dots. If you, t if you do three measurements, you get this uh, blue uh, dots, and if, you, if it's four measurements, then this is what you get. And this is actually, I mean, here it's because it's such a simple, very simple distribution, it is possible to just manually calculate these distributions. And that's your homework. Any questions about this? I mean, this is a really a nice and visual example. That's why I produced it, because I still had the, uh, the impression after talking two times about the central limit theorem that some of you still seem to have a problem with this. And, but because this is so fundamental and important, I decided to produce this uh, little exercise. Okay, and now we are going to talk about principal component analysis, which is a statistical method to, yeah, that might help us to analyze data. Um, and it's, it is made particularly for multidimensional data, not for two-dimensional data as we have it here. But as always, uh, I can only show you two dimensions here on the, on the screen. Okay, so for, uh, for illustration, we work with this two-dimensional example. And uh, now if you look at these uh, data points, I mean, what do you see about these data? Can you tell me something about the, the, the distribution of these data points? Uh, 
I mean, we just talk about uh, uh, random numbers. Are the underlying numbers random? I mean, no, nobody knows, but uh, could they come from a, a random source? They tend to align, yes. Or, in other words, if, if they were random, then they should be more evenly distributed in this square of length 1 and 1 on both sides. Huh? So, they are surely not random. And as you said, they tend to align along a line like that. Huh? So there is some correlation in the data. And yeah, why don't we draw this line here? Um, yeah. If the points would be exactly on such a straight line, all points exactly on a straight line, then one of the two variables would be completely redundant. Yeah? We would only need one of these two variables because the other one could easily pick, be calculated from the first um, variable with a, a linear transformation. Okay, and now, look, our goal is to analyze high dimensional data. Like with 10 dimensions, 100 dimensions, even 1000 dimensions. And it's not uncommon to apply PCA to 1000 dimensional data. No? I, will, I will tell you about such examples later. And in 1,000 dimensions, you can't look at the data, so you need a fully automatic procedure that determines whether there is some redundancy among the data. Um, maybe you want to reduce dimensionality. There are so many reasons for reducing dimensionality. One reason is Stay, uh, saving storage. Another reason is maybe you want to apply to these data an algorithm uh, whose complexity uh, grows quadratically or even worse with the number of dimensions and then of course it saves a lot of computational time if you can do it on, on less dimensions. Yeah? Um, okay. Now, how can we automatically find out whether we have such coupling between variables? And here in two dimensions you can see, so if they are kind of or a little bit aligned, then maybe there is redundancy. And how can we find this out? Now, let's look at this uh, picture here. Um, why don't we draw the orthogonal uh, distance from the points to the line. Yeah. I mean, do you remember such a picture? from last semester mathematics. <coughs> no? How about least squares? When we applied the method of least squares, 
And suppose for a moment we want to fit a straight line through these data points. Then what we did is we, we required the sum of the squared distances between the points and our straight line to be what? Yeah, to become a minimum. And look, here we have all these distances between the straight line and the points. Uh, there is a, a slight uh, difference to what we did last semester. The picture lo looked a little bit different. The lines were not the orthogonals. Yes, how, yeah, that's, that's correct. How were the lines? Uh, uh, vertical. Vertical, yes. The lines were vertical because at that time we only looked at the y value on this axis here. Yeah? Okay, but now we take the orthogonal distance between the points and the line. And now, I mean, now it would be nice to have an animated picture, but uh, sorry, we don't have this. Uh, that, that might be nice. Um, maybe somebody wants to program it for me. Um, look, if we would have an animated picture and I would turn around this line like that and, and all these distances then would move with the animation. Suppose we would, pu we would put the line like that then, of course, the sum of the squared, uh, the black squared distances would become larger because, for example, here this would be much larger, this would be much larger. And now, imagine we turn around this line here uh, and we, we, we could even move it like that. I mean, the question is which one is the straight line for which the sum of the squared distances becomes a minimum. And the solution would be a line somewhere around this. Huh? Um, and we could determine such a line in exactly such a way. So we would have to write down the sum of the squared orthogonal distances between the blue line and the red points and then we would minimize this sum of square distances and we would get this uh, blue line. And this is actually one way to derive uh, this re blue regression line. Um, but now let's, let's take a different view of the whole thing. Now we can, we can also look at uh, the at the variance of our data points. Yeah? And again, suppose we have this animation and we could turn around this line and we, we look at this line as a direction and we ask ourselves in which direction is the variance of our data points maximal. And it's exactly this direction. Yeah? I mean, look at this orthogonal direction. Uh, here in this direction, the variance of our data points is minimal. Yeah? I mean, that's interesting. So, and and it, it really comes out. Uh, so, um, the, the direction of minimum variance is orthogonal to the direction of maximum variance. And, I mean, we don't prove this here, but it is a matter of fact. If we look for the direction um, of maximum variance of our data, it's exactly the same as the direction of the straight line which has minimum uh, 
sum of squared errors to all the points. So we can take the first or the second approach, we would get the same uh, direction um, of our straight line. Is this clear so far? Okay, so uh, now I will follow the second approach. We will determine the direction of maximum variance of our data points. I mean, and I will follow the treatment in the Bishop book. Um, this is actually an excellent book. Let's look at the reference. Yeah, it's this book here. Christopher Bishop, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. Um, I mean, we do have it over there in our library in, in the Institute. Um, okay, now, uh, yeah, let's start. So, what are we going to do now? We are looking for a vector in our high dimensional space. A vector, yeah, and this vector, let's draw the vector again and let's, oh, sorry. Um, and let's now put it in, into the origin, like this. We are looking for such a vector such that if we project all our data points onto this vector, look, projection of the data points on this vector would be something like that. We project this vector to, uh, sorry, here and then we would get this guy. So you see, I mean then the, the points would be distributed on this line and then we would measure the variance on this line and the variance of our data points on this line when they are all projected to the line is, is exactly what we want. Huh? Is this clear? Here on the picture? It's not exactly clear. Okay, so let, let's take a second point and project it onto the blue line. Let's take um, this guy, for example. And now um, we have to continue the blue line. It will be projected here. So this guy is here and this guy is here. Um, Oh, and unfortunately, we shouldn't have erased the other blue line. So the original blue line was here. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you project your points onto this blue line or onto this blue line, as long as these blue lines are parallel. Yeah. So then you get a distribution of points on this blue line and you determine uh, the variance of the, la the points on our blue line. Yeah? And of course, as I already said, the variance depends on the direction of this vector. Okay, yeah. So let's start with the math. We are given data points, n data points, and each point is, of course, a vector, a d-dimensional vector. Yeah? And now, um, our goal is, our final goal is to project our data into a lower dimensional uh, subspace. And in order to do this, we determine, I mean, this new space should have m dimensions and m should be less than d. Then, only then we get a 
dimensionality reduction. Okay, and we start we start for, uh, with m equal one. So um, we want to reduce our high-dimensional data to a one-dimensional space yeah, in the first step. Yeah? So we are looking now in our uh, d-dimensional space for the direction of highest variance of our data and project them all on this one vector. And we call it u1, this vector. And now, yeah, now we have to put this constraint. Um, yeah, I mean, what does this mean? This constraint, u transpose u is equal to 1. What does this mean um, about our vector u? Hmm? Loud? It's a unit vector, yeah. It's a vector of length 1. We have to, we have to make this restriction. Uh, restriction. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise, we would allow um, vectors of, all, of arbitrary length. Yeah? And then, yeah, we will be... Look, if we have such a vector xn yeah? and we multiply it with our vector u1 transpose I mean that's typically what we do when we project a, a, a data point vector onto this vector u1 yeah? when we do this we compute such a uh, uh, inner product then this gives us a projection, but the projection actually would be if we would divide the whole thing by u transpose squared. Huh? Then it's, it's, it's a normalized projection and then it's really the projection. If we would omit this, then the result of course would depend on the length of this vector. Yeah? And remember what we are going to do. Remember the picture. We are looking for the direction uh, where we get maximum variance. We want to maximize the variance. Now if we would this u1 vector allow to be arbitrarily long, then the length of this vector would increase the, the projected values and then we, we wouldn't get a maximum. Then uh, the, these, the sum of these products would go to infinity and there would be no maximum. But if we restrict the length of this vector, we have a vector of fixed length and it, we just turn it around, then we, we will determine the direction of maximum variance. Yeah? And that's why we have to put this constraint our vector u1, this is the vector we are looking for. The, uh, this vector has, has to have length 1. And now we determine all these projections. Yeah? Okay. Now the mean of our projected data is 1 over n times the sum over all the projections, of course. I mean, that's just the, the, the mean vector, yeah? or it's, it's, I mean, we could also say this is the vector pointing to the, to the mean of, of all our data points, the mean on our, li on our line. Yeah? Okay, and here you see this vector u1 transpose does not depend on n, so we can pull it in front of the sum and that's what we get. And look here, this is the mean of all our data points, so we have u1 transpose times uh, the mean. And the variance of our data points, 
This is how the empirical variance is defined, 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of u1 transpose xn minus u1 transpose x bar, the mean. Yeah? So the variance is nothing but the sum of the squared distances to the mean. Yeah, and now, I mean, this is a crucial equation. The variance is equal to u1 transpose times the covariance matrix S times u1. I mean, this is not trivial to see, and that's why we now will uh, derive this equality. We will start from this right-hand side and show that this is equal to that. Yeah. Okay, we start with the definition uh, for the, the covariance of two variables xi and xj. Yeah. Um, yeah, and now remember, that's, that's important. Um, the bold phase symbols are vectors and the non-bold phase symbols are scalars. And look here, these guys are not bold phase, xi and xj. So two ordinary scalar variables. And that's what the covariance is defined for. The covariance is defined for two scalar variant, uh, variables. And we, I mean the covariance uh, tells us whether kind of they depend on each other or not. Um, yeah, and, and, but now here we have a second index. The second index n um, varies over all our data point. I mean, we have a number of data points. Let's, yeah, let's draw a picture again. Um, x1, x2. And now we have such two-dimensional data points. And now, um, I mean, this may be x5. And this vector x5 has the coordinates x5, 1 and x5, 2. And this is a different point. Maybe it's x4. And then we get x4, 2 and x4, 1. And, um, I mean, we want to know the, the, the dependence of these two variables, x1 and x2. And then, of course, we have to take a sum over all our data points. Okay, and that's how this is to read. So the sum over n, x n i, minus x i bar. Look, this x i bar would be, I mean, for example, x1 bar would be here and maybe x2 bar would be here. Okay, and that's how the covariance of two such variables is defined. And now in the next line we have the definition of the covariance matrix. We could just say this is the matrix containing all these Sij. Um, what do we have here? The sum over, and of course now here we have vectors. Huh? xn vector minus x bar vector times xn minus x bar, but transpose. And now the question is, why is the transpose here and not here?
You see, this really goes into linear algebra a little bit. That's actually why I gave you uh, a new exercise about linear algebra in a little bit higher dimensional spaces. But I will talk about this later. Now the question is, why is the transpose here and not here? I mean, look... Uh, Look, this is, this is actually one vector multiplied with, it, with its transpose. So we, we are talking about some vector x times x transpose and about x transpose times x. What is this and what is this? Yeah? X transpose times x uh, should be the identity. Um, no. Not at all, actually. It's neither identity nor matrix. <laughs> That's true? So, what is it then? What is it then? I mean, look, you have two choices. If you don't like this guy, you can talk about this. No, we, we talked about this. Yeah? That's what you meant. You said this is the identity. Yeah? But that's not true. So, but you can also talk about this guy. Now, I mean, let's finish this. I mean, this really is not very difficult. Don't frustrate me so much on Monday morning. Okay, um, so that's enough of my patience now. Um, look, our vectors are column vectors. Huh? So if this x is a column vector, then here we have something we have a row vector here times a column vector of the same length. So what we get is, it's a number. I mean, this is the scalar product. Huh? So if we do this, we get a number. But if we do this, then here we get a square matrix. We get a square matrix and at the position um, i, j, we get the element, the i, j element of some matrix. And that's actually what we get. So here this, this guy, I mean this inside this sum here, is a matrix. It's a matrix. And at the i chaith element, we get exactly this product in here. Okay, so this guy inside the sum is a matrix. Um, and then the whole thing is the sum over n matrices. That's it. Okay. So now this is, this is uh, nothing special. It's just the matrix of all the covariances of all variables. Okay, and now we can look at this term. So remember, our goal is to show that this right hand side is equal to that. That's why we start with this. And now we multiply u1 transpose from the left and u1 from the right onto this s. And um, these two guys do not depend on n, so we can pull them into the sum here from the left and from the right. And now what do we next here? Yeah. Um, 
now we look at this term and this is the product of two vectors um, now let me, let me see um, so we have a vector x transpose times y um, Oh, is this correct? So what happens here? If we transpose the whole thing, then we get um, x times y transpose Oh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, transposing this is y transpose x. Yeah. Or, and I mean, the, mul the, the general formula is x times y transpose is y transpose x transpose. Okay? So if we transpose this product, uh, we have to exchange these and transpose both of them, and that's correct. Yeah. But what we have here is not this. Because here we don't have a transpose on the whole thing. Oh yeah, okay. Now it's clear. Um, because here in this particular example we actually have x transpose y is equal to the transposed. Huh? Because the result of this product here is a scalar. If you take the transpose of a scalar then it's again a scalar. Um, and that's why we can write this vector transpose times this is this transposed times the other one. So that's exactly okay, it. Okay, and, and the next step is we multiply this u1 transpose into into this term and here again and then that's what we get and you see we have a product of a vector with itself and then we can write this as a square. Yeah, and that's actually what we have here. So now we have, we have shown uh, this equation. And why is this equation so important? Yeah, let's look here. Um, yeah. Because we now want to maximize the variance. Yeah, um, look again, so this is the variance of our data. Yeah? This is, oh did I talk about this actually? 
This is the variance. So um, the variance, yeah, uh, the variance of the projected data. This is the variance of the projected data. So the data on the projection of the data on our line. U1 transpose Xn. That's the projection. So we take all the projections and this gives us the variance of our projected data. And now we have shown that the variance of our projected data is equal to this product. And that's why we now will maximize this term. Okay, we will maximize this term. But we will have to do a constraint maximization. And what is the basic constraint? This is the constraint. We have to fix the length of our vector, yeah? of our uh, vector onto which we project. I mean, we will turn around this straight line. It actually doesn't matter whether we constrain the length to be one. We could use any other value and would get the same result. And now we, we set up the Lagrangian, which is the function to be maximized, plus lambda times 1 minus u1 transpose u1. So look, this is our constraint. And the constraints always have to be in the form equal to 0. So this is lambda times the constraint. And now we just apply the standard procedure we take uh, the partial derivative of the quantity to be maximized with respect to this vector u1. Yeah? So, uh, and now what is the partial derivative with respect to a vector? Have you ever seen uh, such a, a thing like partial derivative with respect to a vector? So we have a function depending on a vector x and we derive it with respect to this vector x. And then, then this is equal to what? Laura? It's a gradient, of course. So it's the column vector df of x with respect to dx1 up to xn. This will actually be important for you for, for the first exercise. Yeah? Okay, here we are. We take the derivative of this function with respect to this vector u1 and then this is 2 times s times u1 minus 2 lambda 1 u1. And now of course we set this gradient equal to 0 as a necessary condition for a maximum. So this gra the, the, uh, I mean the gradient has to be zero um, in order to uh, determine a maximum. Yeah. And now we bring this to the right hand side and now we have this um, equation. And now please look closer at this important equation here. This now is an eigenvalue problem. What is an eigenvalue problem? When we have a matrix A, 
times a vector x and this is lambda times the vector x. So if this matrix times x is nothing but a constant times the vector, then this, this, this constant is called an eigenvalue. Okay, so you, you see that this, um, this equation is equivalent to this eigenvalue equation. Um, and thus, this means that our Lagrange parameter lambda 1 is an eigenvalue. It is an eigenvalue of our covariance matrix S. And now remember, we are looking for the direction with largest variance. And then uh, this means that, of course, we, this lambda 1 is the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix S. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the, the basic and the most important insight of today. We see that finding the vector of maximum variance of our data is equivalent to determining, determine, determining the, uh, the maximum eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Yeah. Okay, and now, um, I mean, we, if we multiply this equation from the left with u transpose, then we get u1 transpose s u1 is equal to u1 transpose lambda u1. And if you look at this guy here, then you see, I mean, lambda is a scalar, so we can pull it in front. And then we get u1 transpose u1, which is equal to 1. Yeah? Um, so, I mean, this is the formula to determine, it, to determine uh, lambda 1. Yeah? Uh, or, no, I mean, uh, no, it's actually not how we determine lambda 1. Um, this is to see that the variance, the variance is equal to lambda 1. So this largest eigenvalue is not only necessary to find the direction, it is actually the variance in this direction. So it's really easy. What you have to do to um, determine the direction of highest variance and at the same time the value of the highest variance is just find the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. That's it. Okay, and now we can write this down in a theorem. The variance of the data points is maximal in the direction of the eigenvector u1 to the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix S. This maximal eigenvector is called the principal component. That's the principal component of our data, of course. And now we apply this to our little two-dimensional example. And what we get is these two eigenvalues 0.128 and 0.011. And I mean here you immediately see um, that these data are by far not random because these two eigenvalues are by more than a factor of 10 apart from each other. And the corresponding eigen uh, eigenvectors are these guys here. Uh, so this is the eigenvector to lambda 1. So the eigenvector to the largest eigenvalue. And this is, uh, so this is the principal component. And if we look in our diagram, so in x direction minus 0.78, 
and in y direction point 0.615, that's this vector. And it points exactly in the direction of largest variance. That's exactly where we expected uh, the principal component to be. And this second vector u2 is this one and it is orthogonal to, um, to u1. And look at these two vectors. They are really orthogonal. You see it uh, on the first, maybe the second glance. Huh? Okay, and uh, is this now is this surprising that this second uh, eigenvector is orthogonal to the first one? Um, yeah, I would say yes it is. Yeah, I mean we didn't see this yet. So from the, from the derivation we did up to now, we just calculated the first eigenvector. But I mean what I did here, I, I, I just applied octave uh, to solve the eigenvalue equation and it, of course it gives you all eigenvectors and all eigenvalues. We would have actually only needed these two guys, but we got these two also. And so maybe for this moment uh, it seems to be surprising that this guy really is orthogonal to this one. You can immediately see it, multiply them. You get plus the product of these two numbers minus the product of these two numbers, which is zero. So they, they are orthogonal. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is, this is true in general. So now let's look at, so is this, I mean, is this on the picture orthogonal? Yes? To me it looks, I mean, if I look on the screen here, maybe on the screen I have some distortion. Oh yes, this. Look, it's not orthogonal. But I mean, may the reason be because the the, the screen is dis has a distortion. I guess I guess that's. I mean, I, I really tried it, or maybe the screen, my screen at home, because I drew it on the screen, is different. So it should be orthogonal. Let's put it like that. We define it to be orthogonal. Okay, but actually, I mean, this is just an image. This is the truth. Oh no, this is still not the truth because it's only on three decimal places. But I mean, we will now show that it's really true. Okay, so now we will generalize this method. Remember, what did we want to do? I mean, we want to reduce the dimensionality of our space from maybe 1,000 dimensions to 100 dimensions. Um, up to now, what we did is, I mean, we found a method to reduce the space from 1,000 dimensions to one dimension. And maybe that's too, uh, too much. Huh? because we would lose too much of our information. Uh, oh yes, um, and... Uh, um, do you actually know, maybe we should go back to this example. Do you have an idea? How, I mean, how do we reduce the, the, the dimensionality of our data?
how does this now work? I mean, we found the direction of maximum variance. But now, I mean, look, you have this file of two-dimensional data. A file of data points, each point with two components. And now, our goal is to trans transform these data into a new file with one column only. Now, how does this work? Hmm? Projecting all points to the vector. Projecting all points to the vector. Yeah. And how does this work? Maybe that question is too trivial because I mean it's only this product of the, the, we, we have to multiply this eigenvector transposed times the vector of all the points. And then, of course, we would get a scalar result. So we just multiply all our data points with U1 transpose. And then we get our new file with one dimensional data. Okay. Yeah. So we really know now um, how to reduce our data to one-dimensional data. But now we want to reduce them from 1,000 dimensions to maybe 100. Okay. Uh, so we now need a procedure um, with an m greater than one. We are looking now for the m eigenvectors corresponding to the m largest eigenvalues. The eigenvectors you want through um to the m largest eigenvalues of of ds of s determine the m orthogonal directions of highest variance of the data set. And now look at this orthogonal here. This orthogonal is important. Because this is not trivial. So that means the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix are always orthogonal. And this is not trivial. This is a non-trivial result. And, of course, we will take the m directions of highest variance of the data set. Because, I mean, that's at least our intuition. These guys are supposed to be the most important variables. Okay, yeah. And we will now do a proof by induction. And the good thing is, the basis for our induction, m equal 1, so by induction over m. Yeah? For m equal 1, we have proven the whole thing already. We have even proven the orthogonal. Because there is only one vector, so there is no orthogonal to talk about. Yeah? But as soon as we get a second eigenvector, this has to be orthogonal. Okay, and now we, do, we go into the induction step. Now we assume that we have already determined m such eigenvectors. <coughs> and now we determine the m plus first um, yeah, what is the m plus first dimension? So we have determined the m directions with highest variance. Okay, and now we are looking for the next direction. Now we are looking for the next direction 
in our d-dimensional space and this next direction has to be, that's what we require now, it has to be orthogonal to the m first directions. Look at the two-dimensional example. This is our first eigenvector we get to the largest eigenvalue and now we require, we say, okay, now let's look at the direction orthogonal to this first direction. Yeah? We, are, we now want to, de to, de to determine uh, this direction. Yeah? I mean, in two dimensions this is trivial because there is only one direction left. But suppose we are in three dimensions, then uh, we found one vector, but now the question is which is the direction of a second orthogonal vector and of course, I mean, in three dimensions, if this is our first vector, then orthogonal is a plane. Yeah? And then the next vector may be any of these infinitely many vectors in the plane. And if we are in 1000 dimensions, then uh, there are 999 left for the second vector. Yeah? But we require the next vector to be orthogonal to all the guys we found already. Yeah? Um, because, I mean, why, why do we require this? Because we, we already covered this subspace of the first m variables. So we really want to look in the orthogonal complement of our vector space. Okay, so now that's, we require this guy to be orthogonal. And then, now what do we have to prove? I mean, here it looks like we have to prove that all these directions are orthogonal. No, we require them to be orthogonal and now we prove that these are exactly the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. That's what we prove. Okay, and we do a similar game again. We now maximize Um plus 1 transpose as Um plus 1. Now remember, what is this U transpose as U? Um, where did we have it? Here. It is the variance. That's the variance. And now we want to maximize the variance of this m plus first direction. We are looking for a new direction with maximum variance. This is the new direction, u m plus one. Yeah? This is the new direction in our orthogonal space and, and in the orthogonal remaining space we are looking for the direction with maximum variance. I mean, and that's reasonable. Okay. Um, in the orthogonal subspace, and that's why we have all these constraints, because this new vector has to be orthogonal to U1. And that means the product of these two guys has to be zero. And it has to be orthogonal to U2 and so on up to Um. So we get, we get these M constraints for our maximization. Okay? And of course we also have the, norma uh, yeah, the normality constraint. Um, so again, we uh, require this new vector to have length 1. Okay, so now again we do a constraint maximization. We write down the Lagrangian, which is the function to be maximized here, plus lambda m plus 1 times this normality constraint plus the sum over all these constraints together with multiplied with their Lagrange parameters, we call them 
eta i, and these are the constraints. Yeah. And now we again we do the same game, um, partial derivatives, setting them uh, zero, and that's the result we get. And look, we get again the eigenvalue equation. And this is, I mean, uh, this uh, little step here is your exercise. I mean, this is really just applying the scheme of uh, setting the partial derivatives equal to zero. And that's the result. And again, this is a really nice result. I mean, sometimes mathematics is really nice. Yeah? And now we have proven the whole thing. We have proven that this new orthogonal direction with maximum variance is again um, an eigenvector of our covariance matrix. And of course, here we have to take the eigenvalue uh, the, the, so among the d minus m remaining eigenvectors, oh sorry, this has to be eigenvalues yeah, here on the slide. Yeah, we have to take the largest among the remaining eigenvalues. Okay, so now we have proven this uh, second uh, theorem. And now you can do uh, your exercise. Yeah, and, but let's, let's look together first to these Lexmate data. Um, yeah, I mean, do you remember the Lexmate example, maybe we, uh, we should for a moment uh, again switch to the old slides. No? That was in statistics. I guess it was here. Yeah. That was about the Lexmid uh, example. This was this medical example where we had all these variables starting from age, gender, pain, up to appendicitis and so on. Um, and these are our data sets, how they look like. Huh? So we have 15 input variables and then there is the output variable. And now what I did is, I used the 15 input variables. I deleted this last value, appendicitis. So I just look at the input variables. And um, now we do a principal component analysis on these data. And what I did before I applied PCA is um, I normalized all these data and then we applied PCA. Okay, now let's, let's continue. We, I mean, we looked at these Lexmate data. Um, I normalized all these data and now we go back to the other slides. And what we have to do is really simple, simple and basic. We, we calculate all the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix of these data points. And here we have the eigenvalues sorted. Starting with the largest eigenvalue, and I mean because this is not really nice, I uh, plotted them. So this is the largest eigenvalue, the second largest, and so on. And that's how PCA in, in practice can be applied. So you make a plot of the eigenvalues, look at this plot, 
and then you manually decide how many of these components you want. And here, I mean, a sensible point uh, or threshold might be here because, I mean, these are all kind of significant and here we have a step and maybe we, could, we can neglect all these dimensions. Yeah? So this means we have two, four, six, seven. Uh, the seven largest eigenvalues are now the principal components that I select. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. And now the question is. So what next? What next? I mean, we want to reduce dimensionality of our data. What did we do before? We found this one eigenvector and then we projected all our data on this one eigenvector. I mean, now we found seven such eigenvectors. Now what to do with our data? Yeah, of course, project them into this seven-dimensional new space or seven-dimensional subspace. How does this work? Maybe I leave this to you for the exercise, huh? because you should do it then in the exercise. Okay, yeah, let's finish uh, this uh, section and again say some words about applications of PCA. Dimensionality reduction, of course. Data compression, uh, of course this is related to dimensionality reduction. Because, I mean, if our data file with the LexMed data, n now it has uh, 15 columns, after the reduction it only has seven columns. So we definitely reduce uh, the, the, um, the storage space. Um, yeah, then a, a, a very important and very nice application is in uh, image processing. Um, a real problem in image processing is to come from the pixels to semantic information about, uh, about your, your pictures. So we want to map, let's look at the pixel image. Suppose we have an image with one million pixels and you know that's not much. We do have 15 million pixels if we want. Huh? So we can, uh, and every pixel is a three byte value like that, RGB, yeah? 24 bits for every pixel. So we are living in a 10 million dimensional space. And now when we want to uh, do semantic analysis of the images, we don't want to do this in a 10 million dimensional space. We want to reduce this this large dimensional space to a space of maybe 10 dimensions. Uh, we want to extract semantic features from our picture. And now one, I mean, we might call it a brute force um, uh, way, but it sometimes works. I don't have so much experience with uh, image processing, but people do it like that. You take a set of pictures. Maybe you take a set of pictures of one particular object. I don't know. Maybe we want to design a software to recognize such a ruler. And now I take many pictures of this ruler. 
like that, like that, like that, and so on. 500 images of this object. And these 500 images are now my data collection. Every single image is a point in our one million dimensional space. And now we apply PCA to this data set of images. And now we do uh, what we, exactly what we did here. So now we draw this eigenvalue function and maybe it looks like that. And look, we will get one million eigenvalues. So th this really is kind of a continuous function. And then we make, we would make a cut like here. Huh? And these are, I don't know, hopefully these are only 20, the 21st eigenvalues. And now we have a lower dimensional subspace, which hopefully represents the crucial features about this object. So unfortunately, I don't have practical experience with this, but it seems to be a nice idea. I don't know how, how well it works in practice. Okay, now let's talk um, a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah, and also for data visualization, it might be helpful. Suppose we have seven dimensional data, no chance to visualize them. But maybe I want to look at them. Now what I do is, I apply PCA and take the first, the, the highest two eigenvalues and project them onto this two-dimensional subspace. Oh, I could actually have done it with the Lexmate data and then uh, showed them here. Yeah. Oh, you can do it in the exercise. Okay, now let's look at the exercises. So this first exercise is what I showed you in the beginning. Huh? Um, the second exercise is a reminder of, I hope you did this already at the beginning of last semester when we did linear algebra. So this is the partial, the calculating the partial derivative with respect to a vector of such a product of two vectors and that's the same thing of a product uh, vector matrix vector. Um, I mean on the website there is this sheet called matrix identities and there you can find these formulas but I want you to get a little bit of understanding and uh, do exercise on this linear algebra derivative stuff. Okay, and this is about completing this proof of the second theorem. Um, and now here you, uh, this is the PCA application example. So you shall apply PCA to the Lexmid data. And uh, there is this file, you find it on the website to the lecture, um, with 15 variables. Um, yeah, and now the uh, first determine eigenvalues and eigenvectors from exactly these data. Then normalize the data to the interval 0, 1 and repeat PCA. Now of course look at the difference. What differences will you see when you do it with the not normalized and with the normalized data? Um, and here select the largest eigenvalues. You select how many you take and do the transformation of the data into the lower dimensional subspace. Yes, and of course, now if you take the first two eigenvalues, then you have a two-dimensional subspace and you can plot the Lexmate data. Huh? Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you.